Screen Time Stories is presented by Pinwheel. With Pinwheel, you get to set limits on your child's smartphone to match their maturity level. As your child grows, you can open up more features to guide their independence. There are many options that come with a Pinwheel smartphone, like allowing approved contacts only, remotely monitoring messages, selecting expert vetted apps based on professional guidance, and the scheduling mode to keep your kids living in the moment. Connect authentically with a Pinwheel smartphone for kids and teens. For a 10% discount, use code PODCAST10 at checkout. My guest today is Catherine Nibbs. Kath writes about and works with children who have dealt with cyber trauma. She is a clinical doctoral researcher, child trauma psychotherapist, and author of Children, Technology, and Healthy Development. So I read your recent book, and I have to say one thing that stood out to me was how you applied attachment theory to your research. Why is that something that you're focusing on? Because the thing about attachment theory, one of the things, and and this is what I tried to do in the book, was talk about the differences in what used to be and what is now. But also one of the things that I've done is is I've got another two books coming out in June. They're, they publish on two days apart. Oh my goodness, that's the so book, exciting. The, the, well, it kind of is, but I'm again, I'm off already writing book number five at yeah. the moment because I've done another one about um, cybersecurity and data protection. And I just there's a whole heap of rubbish that I kind of find myself doing. But the, the next two books... Um, One of the volumes is all about the child's sexual uh, issues that arise. So sexting, CSAM, you know, some of the stuff that you've talked about on your podcast before anyway. And then there is a book about what we're calling legal but harmful in this country. Now, I've changed it to legal and harmful because the but is so dismissive in that sentence. I love that. Legal but harmful. You know, eh. And so I just have to make sure when you say this country, where are you right now? United Kingdom. Okay. And your data protection is way more advanced than ours. Um, so I I feel like it's very interesting. And I, like, honestly, I want to just go off on a tangent with you and pick your brain because you guys are definitely a step ahead. And I'm sure you still find faults in it. But, you oh, know, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. legislatively, we've only had, like, one federal law passed in 98 and then um the california governor recently introduced a bill that has not yet passed but it was like bipartisan support so it's you know really wonderful but it you know like in the newspaper articles it's like this mimics things that they've already passed in the uk (laughs) and and yet we still have so far to go in terms of you know especially because we've dropped out of the eu so the, the the four letters that people tend to focus on are GDPR and data protection is so much more than that. This is where my history of being in and around information security, cyber security, businesses, you know, going into banks, casinos. I, I've seen the high end of what people want to protect. Yeah. And the difficulty right at the end of the day, Julie, here is uh, my profession deals with what I call the most sacrosanct data on the planet and knows the least about technology yeah and in using all sorts of services to deliver record transmit communicate and more often and you know i even find this with um some of the police services they will email me and put in details of children and i go you do know that that comes into a for example dot me or google or uh, and that doesn't mean that it's protected yeah yeah, and you've just basically, you know, within the subject line, alerted eh, man in the middle attacks. Okay. Well, I want to I want to take a big step back. I feel like I'm a little bit um, overly excited to talk to you because you're kind of a celebrity in my <laughs> my world. Which I, oh, no, no. <laughs> I know I'm like, but you know, like I said, the I just feel like it's. Um, it's so under-researched and so important. So, you know, I'm a mom, I have kids, I'm in the thick of it. And I feel like um, just any 
anybody that's doing this type of work, you know, anything in this field is just very, very uh, important to me and exciting to me. Um, but anyway, so backing up, like taking a huge step back, I just want to like get to know you. Right. So the short version is I was um, a bit of a rebel in terms of, uh, um, so I, I work a lot with trauma in the psychotherapy office. And would you believe it that most people who come into this profession tend to tend to have this stuff in their background? Uh, my father was in the armed forces, was a radiographer and moved to a city in the United Kingdom where pretty much all of the hard end uh, criminals were housed. And uh, that meant that I got to hear stories about Charles Bronson and some of the other really uh, despicable type of uh, people who were in this particular prison in uh, Wakefield, which is the, the city that I, I still live in now. And around about the age of eight or nine or 10, you know, these were the stories that were being told about who did, why did. And, and I spent a lot of time trying to work out why, why would somebody do that? Why would why would a um, why would a person want to hurt a child like that? Why would they want to hurt another human being, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And by the time I'd got to seventeen, wasn't doing um, what I should have been doing because uh, by that point, pretty much like every other teenager, uh, I'd found out what alcohol was and going out and underage drinking as it is in this country, and. I ended up kind of pulling my bootstraps up, as the as the saying goes, and I went into the army. Now, when I went into the army, I did a role where I was the first woman to do it. It was around day sights, night sights, lasers, all of the equipment that helped, if you like, target the enemy, really kind of electrical, mechanical, electronic and engineering. Fantastic but really difficult because I was uh, in the minority being a female in a male environment. And then I met my husband-to-be at the time, left the army, got married, thought I would live an idyllic life of uh, being the, the wife at home. It's not quite how it turned out because I have a slightly different personality to the one that says you're going to be staying at home mom. And, and whilst I loved and still do love being the mom and, and that kind of role, uh, I have, uh, or I had uh, a passion for wanting to learn, always have done. So I ended up uh, going back into work, which uh, was around computing, technology. And I often found, so when I'm talking about those casinos and banks that I was going into, that there was a, an expectation that it was going to be a man who came in to deliver. And, you know, that was... Uh, the order of the day, I suppose, that there was this idea that technology and women didn't really go together. So it, it kind of sat in the background. And just as we got past the millennium, I decided that actually, no, the thing that always fascinated me as the child was this idea of why people do what they do. Mm -hmm. So I went into psychology, did an undergraduate was going to go and do a master's in cognitive neuroscience. I'd found a, a university but I was a single parent at this point, so I'd got two two little children. I was trying to manage everything and unfortunately didn't have the financial resources to pay for the training. The government was going to help and then it changed its mind because that's what the government does in the United <laughs> Kingdom. And they stopped providing any support for courses unless there was, you know, unless you'd got a job at the end of it, unless you've got a doctoral research thesis or whatever it was. So I went back into the world of uh, gaming, uh, landed myself a job working with a company that, that had connections with Activision Blizzard, EA, Nintendo, et cetera, et cetera. And during that time, decided to retrain as a psychotherapist. I thought, well, it's, it's kind of the same thing, nearly cognitive neuroscience, but not quite the same. And what I actually found was my children were in... Um, I don't know what the equivalent would be in uh, United States or Canada off the top of my head. It might be middle school. So they were just leaving what we call primary school and going into secondary school. So they were around okay. about 10 or 11, coming up to 12. And I got a part-time job, went in teaching sex education in the schools. Um, and what I found was the conversations I was having with children were generally about 
online spaces, gaming. Uh, this was what my children did. It was my background. I'd got a, a huge passion. And what I noticed was children would be talking about spaces online and the teachers and the, the other staff teaching sex education, completely blank. Mm. Huh? What? What are they talking about? And I thought, OK, this is really interesting. And then in 2011, I heard some children and mine talking about um, what's called a snuff movie. Um, so this was a particular movie that they were sharing. Um, I'm not going to name it here. I'll, I'll tell you that separately. Um, and this movie was one that could be accessed and it wasn't within the United Kingdom. So it was set on a server elsewhere. And I started to talk to these children thinking, what, what is going on here? If they're all watching this age 10, 11, 12, 13, what is that doing to their development? What is that doing in terms of their ability to empathise? What is that doing in terms of their ability to understand the world? Just, just what is going on here? And as I trained as the psychotherapist, I started to notice that there was this real discrepancy between parenting, knowledge about the online space, what children were doing, the kinds of games they were playing. So this is in the early days of Call of Duty, Gears of War, Halo, you know, the big AAA games. And what, what really struck me was most of the parents didn't recognise what was on these games. So I had a neighbour whose, whose child was around about 13, playing Grand Theft Auto, and she didn't know what a sandbox game was. She didn't know what the game included. So I started to have conversations with my children, with their friends, with the children I was working with in the schools and the ones that were coming into my therapy office. And I started to notice that their ability to be present for more than 20 minutes at a time, which is around about how long we pay attention for, anything beyond that started to look like what's now being, um, and I'm going to say overdiagnosed as ADHD or ADD, or autism, neurodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. And all of the kinds of letters that we can throw at children out of what I call the big purple book. So this is the diagnostic manual. And yet, what I would find is there was always a correlation, always something that was happening in the background around them playing on um, on their devices and the games that they were doing and the people that they were talking to. So it was around about 2011 I came up with the word cyber trauma. So the books I've got coming out later this year, one of the books is Online Harms and Cyber Trauma. And, and it's something I've been massively, massively passionate about because I think it's so misunderstood and, and and again, people don't have that level of understanding about why children might do what they do. And that, Julie, was the succinct version. <laughs> um, I think that, so I'm excited to read cy Cyber Trauma. Um, I know one <clears throat> of the things that stood out to me, you quoted some research about how in a typical day, so in your, in your um, other book, um, you quoted some research about how in a typical day we ingest more information than somebody in the 1400s would have yeah. come across in their entire lifetime. And so, you know, it does make me feel like I have all the symptoms of ADHD. <laughs> me as an adult, I feel like I have so much coming at me yeah, 24 seven mm -hmm. and so much to stay on top of, you know, Okay, so with attachment theory, this is something that I learned about not too long ago. And mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting. I'm really fascinated by it. And in your book, you talk about attachment theory as it applies to kids and technology. And so I, I just wanted to hear more about that because I personally am just in love with that part of your research. Um, mm -hmm. So like taking a step back though, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, can you help me understand why we should care about attachment styles? Yeah. So what I will do, I'll give the caveat that uh, I generally give when I'm talking about trauma or, and, and, you know, when I'm doing training, this is not a parent blaming exercise. Sadly, we are human beings. And by sadly, we are human beings. I mean, we do not know what we do not know until we know it. And nine, nine times out of 10, maybe, we 
parent as we were parented because it's, and I don't want to use words like programming or, or the kinds of words that make it sound like we have no choice. What generally happens is before we have the capacity to think for ourselves, what we watch, what we witness, what we experience becomes our inner model. So attachment theory is actually uh, a, a proposition put forward by psychoanalytical therapies. And I don't want to go down the route of psychobabble, but essentially in the 1950s, there was a, uh, a psychoanalytical researcher called John Bowlby. And he did a piece of research around juvenile offenders. And what he noticed is that these offenders were from backgrounds where they hadn't had the greatest start. So what he he kind of propositioned, now it does have a political undertone and it's, it's rarely uh, talked about this in terms of this piece of research resulted in uh, the idea that mums had to stay at home and that mums could not work. So it, it had this political spin-off, which sadly does happen with a lot of research is, yeah. you know, um, when when we present something, politicians can use it in a particular way. And what he found is that because these boys, as they were at the time, hadn't had a great relationship with their mums in the early years. Uh, so, the, so the study was called 44 Juvenile Thieves, I think. And what that did was it then put forward this idea that mums should stay at home. And the benefit of the research was when children went into hospital, that actually here was a piece of research that said mums being in hospital with their children was really important. And what it then sparked off was many, many years of lots of different people coming in and using this idea and saying, actually, we can measure, we can actually determine what kind of relationship a child has with their parent. Now, attachment theory is normally talked about as the child's attachment to the parent, but it actually isn't. It's the parent's attachment to the child. And that comes from your experiences as a child with your parent. And, and so it goes backwards. And what, what's been put forward is there are three attachment styles with a further piece of research coming along and saying, actually, there's a fourth. Now, the attachment style you have in your childhood is fairly similar to what you have as an adult, but different language is used when you become an adult. So as a child, we have secure attachment, and that means that you have enough of uh, an experience with your parents and caregivers, as they're often called, that creates the feeling that you are safe and secure in the world, hence the, the secure attachment style. And then you're not going to be surprised at this, there's insecure. And the insecure styles were designated to be two different types and quite often the word anxious gets associated with both of the types. So you will hear anxious ambivalent and anxious avoidant because to be insecure is actually anxiety producing. It, it's, it evokes anxiety. Now, ambivalence doesn't mean, as the kids would say nowadays, nah. it actually means I don't know what is the right answer. So a lot of the time when I'm working with children, it's about they don't know what, in air quotes, mood mum or dad or caregiver is going to be in. And therefore, I don't know what I need to do to adapt my behaviour. And these attachment styles are about survival in the family. So if I live with a parent who shouts at me today for crying, but cuddles me tomorrow for crying, I don't know what I'm supposed to do in order to recruit their caregiving. If I cry and my parent ignores me, then I'm going to go the other way into this avoidant type um, space, which is there's no point in asking for what I need because my needs are not going to be met. So I, I tend to focus a lot in terms of these needs. So what we actually need as a very, very basic um, premise as tiny little human beings is to be safe, to be secure to be seen and to be soothed. Now, those four S's come from Dr. Daniel Siegel's work, and he talks about when those four S's are satisfied, then we are in the secure system. So the attachment research was looking at how do we measure this? How do we define what's a, a secure and 
insecure. And along came the idea that actually some children live with parents who are volatile, who can't even stay in uh, avoidant or ambivalent. They tend to have a mixture of the two. So they're the parents that create a trauma or create an environment that's beyond scary, but they're also the people that help resolve it. Mm. And sadly, much of this research in the 50s, 60s and 70s happened with tiny baby monkeys like Harlow monkeys, as they're, they're known, rhesus monkeys. And those experiments showed us just how devastating it is to not have a secure attachment and often what happens is people will focus in on these attachment styles and they will often say, well, if you've got an insecure attachment style, you, you can never be fixed. However, what we do know is that you can move into what we call an earned secure space, which is why I do the job that I do as a, a therapist, because it's about helping children, adolescents, adults move into a space where through a new relationship, they can mend they won't absolutely cure, and I'm using those two words to help people understand, they can mend what didn't happen in childhood. Because to use a simple analogy, there are things that happen that shouldn't, and there are things that don't happen that should. And that's how we get into this insecure space. And what I'm noticing is the children that I work with that have these difficulties in the online space are from the insecure and the other type of, of traumatizing, which is actually called disorganized. It doesn't, it's, it's not a very nice name, so to speak. So the, the idea that you might be disorganized in your attachment style and insecure in the avoidant or ambivalent styles, they're the children that I work with. Those are the children that get into difficulties online. And it's not to say that people are bad parents it's if we don't know what we don't know, and this is certainly something that, you know, my children have encountered with my army background. I was brought up as an army child. It's extremely authoritarian. There is a uh, uh, little, there, there's kind of little, um, little amounts of touch compared to a secure attachment style. There's, um, there's a lot less physical uh, kind of touching and, you know, Children children who come from insecure backgrounds don't generally get cuddled, if you like, as much as children who come from secure. And that then means that, you know, as a tactile family, there's things missing. And that's what leads to the insecurity. And that's actually what I find with a lot of the children that I work with, a lot of the families that I work with, is those kinds of backgrounds usually result in a difficulty, whether it's in face-to-face -face relationships or what happens online. And it isn't because the parents are stupid or bad. It's because it's that. So the way I actually explain it in therapy is it's like learning a language. If you didn't get taught German because your parents didn't know German and their parents didn't know German or Chinese or Mandarin or whatever language it is, it's going to be difficult for them to provide that level of interaction because it's, it's a piece of the jigsaw that's missing. Yeah, I feel like there's an extra layer to this that I'm, I, I need help noodling through it. But you're talking about this, um, you know, almost like, it's almost like another language having these different attachment yes. styles. But then you also factor in how I grew up without access to um, social media and like, there were some gaming systems out there, but that really wasn't popular when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. so it feels like, like, could you say that the way that children interact with technology today is almost like another layer of a parent learning a new language? I'm saying this very poorly, but... Um, no, 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 your, your, your question is brilliant in its simplicity because... Yeah, so when I've talked about the attachment theory there, okay, so we're talking about the 1970s, okay, we, we, apart from occasional um, arcade games, very few systems existed where it was a daily part of a child's life. But what, what I've come to notice, and certainly as, as I was training as a therapist, so this is going back over a decade ago, I had to go and do 
what was actually quite a weird practical thing I had to go and sit and watch a newborn baby growing up for about two years in a family and never have a conversation with them okay yeah. so this was this was called baby observation and what I started to notice was that this particular family that I worked with there was a little child who by the age of about five to six months was recognizing that the parents had this thing in their hand and there was a particular way they talked to the baby when this thing was in their hand and when it wasn't. And there was a way that they talked about the television and there was a way that they talked to their other children about technology. And what, what I started to do was to, to piece together, okay, Bowlby was in the 70s where television was the, the thing of the day that everybody scaremongered about. You know, if you, if you stand too close, you'll get square eyes. If you yeah. watch too much, you'll become a zombie and all of the other, all of the other myths that are, uh, were around. And what I started to notice was, hang on a minute, there, there seems to be this intervention that has never existed in any of the theories that have been written about child development. This is a brand new thing. So this is going back to, you know, 2010. And of course, I know that it existed before then because I've been working in and around technology. And my children who are, you know, mid to late 20s grew up with technology. And when they were in the region of about three, four, maybe even five, uh, they wanted to play on granddad's computer or mummy's computer. And one of the things that we did was we bought um, uh, adaptation. So there was a game called Tonka, Tonka Toy Town or something like that. And it was a little, a little area where you went in and you did um, sawing and hammering and cutting. And basically this was a device that sat on top of the keyboard. And I was then starting to reflect on, oh, my word, my children have grown up with this thing where it was like, I want to go on the computer. I want to go on the computer. And at the school, uh, and, and this was the area that I was working in at the time, the computers in the schools were very basic. And yet nursery level. So this is in, in the United Kingdom. This is children who are three and four years of age were being introduced to the dollies and the Lego and the cookery corner and the sand pit and the computer. And I thought, how fascinating, how fascinating is this, that children's worlds have just become so much more technological. And I think that kind of the question you're asking is, so when it comes to the language of working with children, not only do we have what we had as parents, there's also a huge puzzle piece missing of language because I am very privileged. I grew up with parents who had technology. That is part of my past. It isn't, it isn't the everyday part of uh, if I'm working with somebody who looks after children, uh, like a kinship carer, and they're in their 60s. They have no idea about technology. This is not in their historic repertoire. This is not something they grew up with. It's not something that's automatic. And I think what will happen is in 10, 20, 30 years time, the parents of tomorrow have grown up with technology. Mm -hmm. So this is already in their language of attachment. This is the thing that they have, have been around. And I think the difficulty that we're all facing at the minute is the cohort of parents who are probably 30, I'm going to go at a guess here, 30 upwards who didn't grow up with this technology apart from arcade machines and maybe the, I don't know, the SNES or Nintendo or whatever. Mm -hmm. When we have this generational insecure attachment style, like you said, we don't know what we don't know. How mm -hmm. do we recognize that we're exhibiting this kind of behavior and furthering it in our children? Self-awareness is a, a huge part. So I had a conversation about this yesterday on, on LinkedIn in terms of it's great having intervention. So let's just go with where we are at the minute. TikTok have now put in this, you know, intervention that says after 60 minutes, we're going to remind you. Well, actually, one of the things that's helpful in human behaviour uh, as, as a whole is recognising the before. So, for example, with eating, when I'm heading towards the fridge, when I'm heading towards the shop to go and get the bottle of wine, when I'm heading towards the cigarette, what is it that's going on for me? Because I think as, as parents, particularly in today's world, it is stressful. 
we are certainly working harder and more often than we ever have done in the past. We are disconnected from nature in a way that we haven't been for a long, long time. There is a certain amount of pressure for everybody to achieve and to be busy and, and, and this idea of, and I don't like this word, but it is hustle porn, which is everybody has to be successful. Everybody has to be the best mom on the street or the most successful dad in the business. And, and, and it's expectations that are way beyond what anybody can realistically achieve on a daily basis. So for some of the parents that I work with, it's about, okay, so technology can sound like a frightening area, but actually you're experienced at succeeding through childhood and making it to become an adult. So you have experience in relationships, in fallouts, in the idea of um, going through adolescence and what a tumultuous time that can be. So you already have that experience. And that is an absolute gift in terms of talking with children. I think one of the difficulties that certainly happened over the past 20 years, and um, again, terminology that I think comes from mainstream media is this snowflake generation. Hmm. Actually, I think what we did was we tried to make amends for the authoritarian 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. And we, we went a little bit too far in the opposite direction and became very liberal and everybody can win. And what that did was it kind of... Um, rock the foundations of what it is to be human and what it is to be parented and parents don't want to fall out with their children they want to be friends with them and sometimes parenting is the hardest job in the world because you have to be compassionate you have to have empathy and in order to do that sometimes you've got to fall out with your child and say no and that is really difficult in a world where we're not just talking Adidas trainers anymore or, as it was in my days, a head bag or some sort of tracksuit. This is about technology. And if you don't have, and I think I went into this in the book, if you don't have the latest console, if you're not, you know, in with the crowd that's got the latest PS5 or Xbox, then there is this idea that you are something less because you don't have. So parents are falling uh, uh, foul of the pressures it then becomes this territory in the house that you know sometimes it's just a piece of give them give them five minutes peace go on the xbox just go on youtube leave me alone to do the cooking because actually the stresses and strains of the 21st century and you know since and during and post lockdown it's difficult so the first the first kind of piece of advice i give all of the parents is notice what you do with technology Notice when you want to reach for it. Notice when you have reached for it. And notice what it is you're doing there. Are you looking for something? Are you looking for affirmations? Are you looking for reassurance? Are you looking to see if you're doing okay? Are you looking for comparison? Are you looking? And again, for me, it's never about the tech and the time. It's about the modus operandi. What are you trying to achieve with this? There's a difference between sitting on an Excel spreadsheet and putting in, I don't know, whether it's uh, data from the place that you're working at or, I don't know, your timesheet, your accounting. Those are different kinds of um, applicability that you're, you're doing versus, well, why am I on social media? What is it that I'm trying to do? And we live in a world right now where phrases like my truth authenticity and this is one of the difficulties in terms of these words is the only way I can feel authentic is to share everything about me and my children and my children share everything and that's how I get recognition and actually that goes back to the four s's what is it you're looking for are you looking to feel safe are you looking to feel soothed secure or is there something else going on you know it's, it's what what are we looking for as the grown-ups what's missing from our self-esteem, what's missing from our world. Wow. I really appreciate you being able to um, communicate what you have learned in the way that you do it. I, you know, even talking about attachment styles, I, it was just so easy to understand, you know, helping us understand what we're getting into, why it matters and steps to take forward. I'm just, I'm just so blown away. I'm so appreciative of like everything you've done leading up to this moment. 
Pinky. Well, thank you. I'm feeling rather like, okay, sheepish, embarrassed. Uh, it, it, see, this is all my own stuff going on at the moment about who do I think I am talking about this? <laughs> yeah. It, it's difficult because yeah. this is, and this is why I become so passionate, especially on social media and, and in the books and so on, is the why is the is the way that we work this out and as, as i said on on uh linkedin yesterday we we often jump to the technological intervention and the bit that's missing so this was the the whole premise of my uh tedx was we we meet people with our bodies with our energy with our minds and if we can't do that because we didn't get that when we were little we're gonna go looking for it and i talk about in there so we've got the out here and we've got the in there. And for me, there's something about so often, and this is why I, I use the phrase e-attachment in terms of attachment theory was based on two parent families. Uh, but nowadays, those two parents might be the, the caregiver and their phone, or it might be a three parent family, which is, uh, and, and just to give you a, a, a vocalization of the chapter, if you are a baby who only sees the smile on your parents' face when they hold that damn thing towards you and it flashes and they go, hi, smile, which is mother ease, which is, it's an enticing language. You know, nursery teachers sing to children like this and you feel so special in that moment, you're going to start to go and it's when that thing is present. Wow. And when that thing is not present, I am lesser of a human being. So that thing whatever it is, whether it's an iPad, a smartphone, or, or that thing becomes the thing I associate, that's when I'm appreciated, that's when I'm wanted, that's when I'm needed, this is when I'm important. And there is 27 years of this already that's been happening. So this is the thing about when I talk about attachment theory and so on, um, there's a lot of conversations that say, yes, well, we need to look after the children. And I'm like, the children are 27 years old already. Yeah. This is this has been happening for a long time. Yeah. Sometimes I think when people come to my training or when I talk like this, there is a whole heap of oh, I'm such a bad parent because or oh my oh my days, I didn't do that for now. That was the entirety of my therapy training. When I learned about this fantastic theory, and then I was like, oh, I didn't do that. But I did. I did, but I didn't, and I did it in different ways. And and actually. The thing that I say to a lot of my parents, and I'm going back to that caveat at the beginning, is if you don't know what you don't know, you can't put something into place. Once you learn something, you have a choice. Yeah. So this is about people being empowered about, well, actually, if I now know that this device is, is getting in the way of my communication with my child or the device is getting in the way of their communication with me, something's got to change because I now know this is a problem. And, you know, that's why I talk about it isn't just the device, because the device is a tool and a medium. Yeah, it's a tool with which we use, and it's a medium with which we engage with other people. So I would certainly say punitive measures, i.e. taking the phone or taking the smart device away from a check, the console, whatever it is, doesn't work. You're actually penalizing the social engagement system in a human being. And if you really want to remember what that's like, just remember the days when you got grounded as a child and you couldn't go out and play and how hurt you were inside and how you made those kind of assumptions about, oh, everybody's going to hate me because I'm so bad. And it's the same with devices. And so many of us are looking for external validation. We're looking for social proof because actually the thing that we're not doing is we're not meeting those needs with each other in the real world. Hmm. And that's, that's adults as well as children. Yeah. No. And I, I really appreciate you um, just having that little bit of humility there saying that um, you had the, the mom guilt <laughs> when you were going through your schooling and oh, I realizing. I cried, Julie. I cried, it, I sobbed. I was like, I, I was a terrible parent. Um, and I know that, I now have a joke with my children. We do this thing where they go, oh, yeah, there was the pre-therapy mum and then there was the post-therapy oh. mum. Oh. Uh, let me tell you, you do not want to meet the pre-therapy mum because it was authoritarian. It was and I, I'm, because I knew no different. And in today's world, I have a toolbox of interventions as a therapist. I didn't have them as a mum. Yeah. Not to begin with. You are amazing. I think that takes a lot to be able to 
recognize, you know, that self-awareness piece is very difficult. And so just being able to Mm -hmm. um, have that share that it's possible and then inspire the rest of (laughs) the parents out there who are feeling like, I I wonder if for some people, the the guilt, the mom guilt or dad guilt can be so strong that you don't even want to come to that piece of recognition where it's like, oh, this is just too. And and I think certainly um and it's it's i wrote i wrote a blog recently about the way that we talk to parents about child sexual abuse imagery we we point at the parents well you shouldn't have let them on the device you shouldn't have given them one you said well i think it's about time we stop pointing uh, fingers at parents parents are doing the best that they can with the tools that they've got and actually if we can educate and give parents tools my word it changes it changes the paradigm and too often There's finger pointing exercises from politicians and social media companies. Well, it's the parents and the parents look at the teachers and the teachers look at how about we all come together. This is a societal issue. This is not this is not about parents failing. This is about parents being scared. This is about parents not knowing. I love that. That's that. I feel like that alone is just very empowering and, you know, inspiring to take that that step into something that's uncomfortable. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay. I am so appreciative of your time today. Um, I I can't believe, I can't believe how amazing this interview went. I feel like I have just, <laughs> like, I, I'm fangirling out a little bit. <laughs> so I'm, I'm slightly gushing now going, oh my God, I do this at people as well. <laughs> <laughs> I just, ap- I just appreciate you so much. Well, thank, thank you very much. And again, you know, um, if parents come back with questions or anything like that, Julie, then Let's do it again. Okay, I love it so much. Thank you so much. I'll I'll be in touch, okay? okay? All right. Take okay. care for now. Okay, and next week we'll actually talk a little bit more about attachment theory, but this time it's going to be with an amazing digital wellness expert named Jennifer Joy Madden. She's going to be applying this theory to tech and babies so if you have little ones or if you know anybody that does please be sure to hit subscribe so that you can be on the lookout for that next episode coming up and that's it for today Um, just remember to not try to strive for perfection in your parenting especially as we're learning how to handle the digital age your goal as a parent is to be good enough talk to you guys next week Thank you.